Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think, uh, I, first of all, I thank the organizers to give me this opportunity. Uh, so, as Dr. Kalyan said, I think it's a very broad topic. So, uh, I, what I thought was I'll just brush through uh, most of the adrenal and pituitary disorders. I think which are most relevant to our clinical daily practice. So it's basically recapping what we are doing here. The uh, findings are fitting with the clinical picture. I think that's probably uh, a fit with our bill. Uh, and uh, vice versa, if it is more than 15 or more, more importantly for most recipients, sensitivity, if it is more than 18, and then you can exclude uh, additions. Uh, so in, I think most of the times we end up with doing a simulatory test for confirmation because this is, this is quite important step, unless, as I said, uh, when we have equivocalisms. So gold standard test remains insulin tolerance test where you give. At that point, you uh, test your growth hormone and uh, your cortisol levels, and cortisol levels should be around the uh, same target of around 18. Uh, so it's a very cumbersome test. Sometimes patients need admission or at least a four-hour hospital stay because they can have uh, problems. Uh. Inherent to the technique we use, uh, the immune analysis, I think they have got quite a bit of pitfalls. Uh, first of all, is a cross reactivity where these assays can cross react with uh, 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 similar products like prednisolone and cortisol, HLH uh, and HCG, and various other hormones. And anti lesion antibodies, uh, human mouse antibody, neutrophil antibodies, and uh, uh, IgM part of the red factor can interfere with various assays and we have to be uh, careful in intermittent this. Uh, of course, autoantibodies, uh, which uh, react with our own uh, assays, uh, <coughs> can give a false use of the thyroglobulin, insulin, and other thyroid hormones. And we very well know about the macroprolactins, which may have a significant problem with prolactin assays, and the high dose would affect the same thing with uh, uh, prolactin SCG and thyroglobulin. So, whenever we have mismatch of clinical and biochemical results, uh, we need to go back and see whether these are the uh, uh, interferences which are influencing the results. It's quite important. So I'll just uh, go through the, I think one of the common tests we do uh, and we are increasingly doing it because we are receiving a lot of cases about fatigue, chronic fatigue syndrome and other things. We end up doing a lot of cortisol levels and uh, how to go along with that. So I, I think um, we need to know about certain factors when we interpret the cortisol levels. Stress response can increase your cortisol levels, although uh, depression is a major one uh, which can cause higher cortisol levels, uh, but stress can cause uh, <coughs> influence on your cortisol levels as well. And as discussed, circadian rhythm is very important. Uh, we have to uh, take history, especially the, 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 the social situations that are changing. And uh, total cortisol level, uh, I think unlike uh, uh, thyroid levels, we don't have freely available free cortisol levels. So the, as we know, cortisol, uh, majority of it, 90% of it is cortisol binding globulin. So the, the, any changes in the cortisol binding globulin, as we know, which can be increased by pills, estrogens, some of the other things, and you know, the levels can be decreased by other factors. So, we, so there will be a lot of interference with this. Uh, free cortisol is available, uh, but I think it's, 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 uh, it's very uh, specifically done. <coughs> thyroid status, it's important to know because hyperthyroid can cause an you know, clearance of cortisol and give uh, false free low levels, and vice versa with the uh, hypothyroid status. As we discussed, medication and renal disease can influence these results. Uh, so, by real insufficiency, I think. I think uh, uh, I think it, it is still a standard practice to do with uh, a random cortisol level. I think early morning level of about 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. Uh, I think if it gives a uh, equivocal result like less than 3, I think we can go ahead. Uh, if the clinical uh, findings are fitting with the clinical picture, I think that's probably uh, fit with our bill. Uh, and uh, vice versa, if it is more than 15 or more, more importantly for most respiratory and sensitivity, if it is more than 18 and then you can exclude uh, medicines. Uh, so you know, I think most of the times we end up with doing a stimulatory test for confirmation because this is, this is quite important step unless, as I said, uh, when we have uh, equivocal results. So gold standard test remains insulin tolerance test where you give insulin uh, about 0.1 to 0.15 uh, units per kg body weight and where you induce hypoglycemia, ideal hypoglycemia should be around 30 to 40 levels. At that point you uh, test your growth hormone and uh, your cortisol levels and cortisol levels should be around the uh, same target of around 18. 
so it's a very cumbersome test. Sometimes patients need admission or at least uh, four hour hospital stay because they can have uh, problems uh, with some of the really, uh, with the synecdoche doses. Sorry, no, insulin doses. Sometimes you can have uh, syncopal episodes, and uh, you have to be very cautious in elderly patients with seizures. Uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, so I think uh, <coughs> uh, we, we have to be a bit cautious and also meteorobone and CRH stimulation tests, we are not using that much, uh, I think, but I think in a few specific situations you can use. So the gold standard remains a CTH stimulation test. Uh, I think uh, we have been using 250 micrograms of synaptin and assess the response at 30 minutes and 60 minutes. But I think more and more data is coming up and more and more um, uh, uh, recommendations are now for go for a low dose uh, uh, stimulation test with one microgram, uh, and which has recent studies have shown equivocal results in both sensitivity and specificity when compared to uh, a high dose of ACTH. Because ACTH 250 micrograms is very superphysiological level, and there are some uh, <coughs> uh, opinions that it's probably not a uh, practical leg. So I think we're still doing uh, ACTH, but again, if you want to use one microgram, I think it's very difficult for the dilution. You have to be very careful uh, diluting the uh, dose which is available. I think Sinactin, now we are using actin prolongatum. I'm not sure how much dilution we have to do to get one microgram dose, but I think that is probably, I think we have to do uh, work out on that. Um, I think uh, once we have a equal result uh, that uh, the patient has a license, I think, uh, you do a ACTH or you can do the ACTH along with the stimulation test as well. And uh, ACTH should give you a fair idea where we are heading. If it is primary, uh, the, the ACTH is very high and then you go for the abdominal imaging or look for other uh, uh, SS like uh, anti adrenal antibodies and consider polyglandular syndrome, also free fatty acids if there's a suspicion of adrenal leukodystrophy. Uh, and then secondly, uh, I think it uh, differs a bit from primary. I think clinical picture should give us by this time, I think, uh, uh, whether it's a, a primary or a secondary mechanism. I think uh, we should be very uh, much reminded of uh, uh, history of steroid use with chronic suppression of HPA axis. Um, I think these patients uh, do not need mineral uh, treatment because of the adus uh, axis of uh, aldosterone and renin axis. Uh, and then there's uh, the simple, the signs can be subtle uh, in these situations. Uh, I think uh, progression can be very acute, as we see in the acute adrenal crisis, or gradual, where you lose the basal secretion first, followed by uh, not an increase, uh, <coughs> no increase in response to stress. Um, so, uh, I think that's one more important thing we see in our clinical practice is we are getting more and referrals from critical care team and the patients are uh, under uh, in these patients or situations. I think there are not much guidelines which guide us. Uh, I think uh, most of the results in these situations are, I think uh, the European Society of Critical Care Medicine and the ICU uh, both have come up with these guidelines where uh, after ACTH, if you have less than nine increment of microgram per TL increment of cortisol, I think that can be taken as diagnosis. Or uh, the random sample of less than 10 uh, is taken. Uh, but I think in these kind of situations, I think uh, most of the uh, uh, critical care team are, are very upfront in giving steroids in these kind of situations. But we need to make sure that these are followed up and they're not on long-term steroids and you have to do a ACTH stimulation tests or uh, other tests as needed to make sure that these patients are not on uh, unnecessary long-term steroids. Uh, I think uh, one of the situations where you have to do is appropriate history or refractory shock where the guidelines are very clear that you have to go with uh, steroids in these kind of situations. Uh, I think use of steroids, I think we all know, as I said, I think it just breaks through. Um, when critically ill, we start with a very high dose of hydrocortisone, 100 milligram, uh, 6 hourly, and then you gradually taper it. And by the time the patient is well, you switch to oral hydrocortisone, probably initially 30 to 40 milligram for higher doses. And then when the patient is stable, you go to a normal dose of uh, 15 to 25. Um, make sure you do mineral corticoid dose and if it's a primary uh, insufficiency. Um, I think uh, we, we, tend, we need to make sure that we avoid giving supraphysiological doses uh, because of the problems associated with it. Uh, and there's a lot of data uh, which I have shown few uh, which are associated with high physiological doses of uh, hydrocortisone. 
uh, which include uh, weight gain, dyslipidemia, and uh, even osteoporosis in some of the studies. Um, just to recap again, moderate illness, uh, I think the patients are unwell, uh, you increase uh, the hydrocortisone dose uh, accordingly, and when the patient is severely unwell, you go back to the dose of hydrocortisone, IV, and then gradually taper it. Uh, I think minor procedures, uh, we generally don't recommend any. I think small, uh, <clears throat> moderate, uh, stressful procedures like endoscopy, which we often get referrals for, uh, we tend to give a status of hydrocortisone. Again, it all depends on the individual patient, but I think these are the general guidelines. With a major surgery, of course, uh, before the surgery, uh, you put the patient on high dose hydrocortisone and gradually take it down as the patient recovers. Uh, HP axis suppression, I think this is more and more relevant uh, and it's becoming more and more referrals now. I think, uh, I think in my setting, I think the rheumatologists do very well in decrease and gradually tapering the steroid doses, uh, but we do get referrals from them as well, uh, how to uh, do this. So HP axis suppression will depend on the steroid doses, uh, how, how much you use them, how long you use them. Uh, and what time you use them. If you do, if you use the steroids at the night time, there's a significant ACTS suppression, uh, and the recovery will take a longer time. Uh, we need to make sure. That I think general consensus is that more than three weeks of steroids, 15 milligram equivalent, will lead to inevitable uh, suppression. Uh, recovery might take about six to nine months. So we have to cautiously withdraw. It. I think, uh, I think uh, the, the general guidelines differ, but I think you, you, you tap it down significantly very fast but to 5 to 7.5 milligram and then thereafter you significantly close it down. Otherwise you can shift to hydrocortisone, which, which is much easier on the HP axis recovery. Uh, I, I prefer patient shifting to hydrocortisone and gradually decreasing the dose. Uh, <coughs> Excess, uh, I think I think this is uh, the common in outpatient hospital settings will be practically kind of reference uh, uh, to, to rule out the fishings. And especially we are uh, seeing, uh, especially in the uh, oncology settings, we are seeing more and more paradigmatic manifestations of uh, uh, pushing syndrome. Uh, so we need to be aware of this, and especially we need to be uh, aware of uh, subclinical pushings. Uh, and how, how do we do this is, uh, I think salivary cortisol is a very sensitive and specific test because it is a free cortisol, unlike your total cortisol elsewhere. Uh, CBG is absent uh, and it is a very easy test to do. Uh, I think but the standard uh, uh, line of assays remains, uh, it's a methadone suppression test and a 24 hour cortisol, uh, whichever is, is uh, convenient. I think we, we need to make sure uh, that, that uh, renal function is normal when you are assessing 24 or urine cortisol. So once you know that cortisol levels are high, we need to make sure you repeat it uh, with the other assay which you haven't used before. And once you know that the cortisol levels are high, then you proceed with what is the cause. Then the best assay uh, would be to go to for ACTH. Uh, the ACTH is high and this ACTH dependent. It can be due to ectopic or PQT pushings. And then you go for MRI PQT in this case, and you go for ectopic screen testing in terms of imaging of your chest and abdomen and uh, other factors. Uh, ACTH independent, you have a very suppressed uh, ACTH, and you have to go for adrenal imaging. Uh, I, I think we have already, uh, Dr. Sanand has already talked about hyperinsulin, so I'll just uh, skip through that. I think just a line of uh, few cytoma, uh, we need to have a very high index of suspicion in appropriate settings. Uh, plasma metanephrines are very highly sensitive, uh, but the problem with them is they are, uh, this specificity is less or almost 80 to 85 percent. So you have to be uh, make sure uh, that you, you do have plasma metanephrines when your clinical uh, suspicion is very high. Uh, in those cases, plasma metanephrines are quite useful. But if your clinical uh, suspicion is very low, then you might probably go for a 24 hour urine metanephrines or catecholamines, in fact. I think most of the reference we get is where your catecholamine levels are slightly higher, uh, probably less than two times the normal levels. I think in these kind of situations, I generally tend to repeat the levels again uh, and look for interfere factors, your medication and uh, other dietary interferences. I think once you rule out, I think most of them come back to normal. Uh, unfortunately, these patients would have already had a CT, MRI, and in fact, a lot of uh, newer scans which have come uh, in these uh, assays. I think Dotate and Dotamag uh, scans I think are still not validated, but I think are, uh, I think they are still being used uh, in these situations. 
And uh, other thing we come across is adrenal masses, adrenal incident aroma. Uh, they are more and more frequent due to various reasons now, uh, because we are uh, doing imaging for other purposes. We need to make sure with these incident aromas, whether they are functional or non-functional, 85% uh, or non-functional. I think if they are functional, most common is cortisol. Uh, less than 0.6% is all the students secreting ones, and very rarely you have realizing tumors. Uh, probably only 50 cases have reported till now. Uh, and if you have incident aroma and hypertension, again, you have to have a uh, screening for realizing tumors. Uh, benign and malignant imaging, I think CT is the best choice. I think if you have an adrenal lesion which is more than six, six centimeters, I think that's almost uh, uh, puts in a, a malignant pathology. Uh, I think if the size is around say, four centimeters cut off, the 90% sensitivity. Uh, other factors which will help us are uh, increasing size, over the counter, irregular marginal appearance, very favorite than your classic pathology. I think, uh, I think uh, we have to have a close mediation with the radiologist when you're interpreting the CT scans, which will give us a much more clue uh, regarding the management of these adenomas. I think uh, that because of the lip, high lipid uh, laden uh, adenomas, I think that they have got a very, uh, a very good uh, index of 10 HU threshold value for the suspension. If the HU uh, value is higher than 20, I think it's almost malignant. Uh, and then the, the, the management is entirely different. And uh, the contrast enhancement washout is also very important, which will uh, give us a clue regarding the diagnosis of adenomas, which have a very delayed washout because of the inherent lipid and lipophilic uh, uh, inclination. So MRI, uh, I think, is the second choice. I think we use CT for most of our evaluation of adrenal lesions. Uh, I think uh, in, in specific situations, you can go for uh, DG PET as discussed. There are various PET CTs with various um, uh, uh, modules we are using now. We can use DOTA, DOTA TATE, and DOTA NOC. I think we have to liaise with the nucleus physician to uh, uh, choose the appropriate uh, agent in this. Uh, I think if you have discussed. I think just a few talks about pituitary tumors. I think uh, they are going to, uh, for 10 to 15 percent of all brain tumors, we are more in getting more reference for pituitary uh, empty cell syndrome and pituitary adenomas, incident adenomas. We are getting more and more reference. And we need to make sure uh, the endocrine and clinical pathological uh, correlation with this. We have to do a hormone assay in this uh, to determine whether they are endocrine active or inactive. And we need to make sure, I think there's a lot of information coming up with this uh, uh, genetic testing for pituitary adenomas. As we know, men uh, is very clear cut. And when you have family history, familial history, I think you go uh, uh, men gene screen. Uh, FIPA is also increasingly common. Uh, I think uh, that's, sorry, the familial isolated pituitary adenoma. We need to make sure uh, the relevant clinical history and you assess for AAB gene. Uh, I think extreme uh, growth, less than five years, you could look for XQ26-3. And if you have a chronic complex features with multiple endocrine problems, you have to go for PRKR, money, and uh, also with FIO and ganglioma if you have if you go for SDHX. So it's very important, pituitary adenoma. I think uh, genetic is uh, something which is coming up very uh, uh, good, and we have got now assessments to look into these. Uh, I think hormone assessment, I think we all know, I think it's just uh, you test various axis, uh, glucose hormone axis, reproductive axis, uh, regarding the dynamic testing which we already discussed. Prolactin is a very good test which we give us a lot of clue uh, regarding your uh, pathology, whether it's a cellular problem or a, a, a stock compression, I think, uh, which will influence our management or radiology uh, procedures. I think in the management wise, I think there's a lot of interest now where non-functioning pituitary tumors are being managed with uh, cabagolin and acutrite with very good results. Uh, but I think this depends on the, sensitivity, the, the chemical uh, sensitivity of the tumors itself. But they are mostly used for residual tumors following a different uh, surgery or radiotherapy. Uh, I, th I think but they are good choices at the moment. Uh, I think mainstay remains surgery and radiotherapy uh, with the MRI surveillance for a long time. A uh, lot of agents are coming up, uh, like uh, Pazitrotide, uh, which is a somatostatin antagonist, uh, which acts in the receptor 5. And Mephiprostone is a glu uh, direct gluco glucocorticoid receptor antagonist. can be used in Cushing's when we don't have options of surgery. Uh, so there, and uh, metacolone, ketogone, of course, we use mainly in the, in the setting of uh, ectopity ACTH production. 
where uh, there's no choice of chemotherapy for the patients when we, use, we tend to use these agents. Thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, sorry, it's a bite topic, so I'm just trying to cover and brush up recap what we are doing on it.